In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Inshallah, continuing with our study, our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sirah nabawiyah the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we were talking about some of the events in the aftermath of the Battle of Khaybar, uh, which essentially was the end, the conclusion of the seventh year of Hijrah, the seventh year of the Prophet ﷺ's residence in the city of Medina. So inshallah, what we're going to start, what we're going to be talking about today, or at least what we'll be starting off with is the last uh, notable event that occurred uh, at the end of the seventh year of Hijrah, before we then start uh, our discussion on the eighth year of Hijrah, which of, again, of course, is a very, very notable year, because essentially the eighth year of Hijrah is known as the year of the conquest, the opening, the Fath of Mecca. So before we start that, we'll talk here very briefly, very shortly about the last major event or incident that occurs here at the end of the seventh year. It's very interesting because what it illustrates is that there were still many challenges that were being faced by the Muslim community. And there were still many enemies of the Muslim community at that particular time. So one particular incident uh, that's mentioned here, it's mentioned by many of the historians, many of the scholars such as Waqidi, Bayhaqi and others, is that when the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Dhul Hijjah, at the end of the seventh year, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, the Prophet ﷺ returned back from what was called the Umratul Qadha. That's what we talked about previously. The Umrah that the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba performed. And so when they returned back, the Prophet ﷺ gathered 50 Sahaba, 50 men, appointed Ibn Abi Awja as Sulami, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a Sahabi, as the leader of that group, that delegation. And he sent them in the direction of Banu Sulaim, which was a tribe. Now, one of the individuals of Banu Sulaim, one of the key members of that tribe, was with the group. So the idea here basically was that he had come to Medina, he had you know, spoken to the Prophet ﷺ, expressed some interest in you know, being sent with a group of people to be able to go there and dialogue with his people. So they, along with this individual from that tribe of Banu Sulaim, these 50 people, these 50 men, they went in the direction of Banu Sulaim. However, the narration mentions that when they left the city of Medina, this individual from Banu Sulaim who was with them, at whose behest they were basically going to Banu Sulaim, he left the group, he defaulted, he defected, he left the group, he went back to Banu Sulaim, he informed them that the Muslims are marching towards you, right? He basically embellished it. He quote-unquote said they're marching towards you. And he warned them that, listen, this is an act of aggression and you need to respond accordingly. So much so that when Ibn Abil Awja, the leader of this group along with his 50 men, when they arrived there at Banu Sulaim, Banu Sulaim was already waiting for them. And they, ha- they basically ambushed them. They surrounded them. And Ibn Abil Awja, when he saw them, he said, no, 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 we're not here to fight. And the narration mentions, da'awhum ilal islami. That Ibn Abil Awja said, no, 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 we're not here to fight. We're here to call you to Islam. We're here to dialogue with you. We're here to talk to you. And he called them and invited them to Islam. This is what we're presenting. This is what we'd like to talk to you about, etc., But the people, they said, we're not interested in what you have to say. We have no need for what you're here to talk to us about. 
And instead, they launched an attack on them. And they started basically launching arrows at them from all sides. They had them completely surrounded. And while they were launching arrows at them from all sides and kind of bringing them in closer and closer and basically cornering them, by that time, uh, reinforcements from Banu Sulaim arrived. And at that time, they basically attacked the group. And most of the group, the Muslims fought very valiantly. But most of the group was killed, was shaheed. And Ibn Abil Awja, he was very severely injured. There were just a handful of survivors afterwards. And what those survivors did was that they were able to escape, they were able to retreat, and they took Ibn Abil Awja, they carried him, and they took him back to the city of Medina. And uh, by the time they got back, because the journey was long and everything that took place, when they got back to the city of Medina, it was about a month later, and at that time they went back to the Prophet ﷺ and they informed him of everything that had ha- happened and everything that had transpired. So this is just an incident that occurred at that particular time. At least immediately it would not play into the major political scene within that, er- within that region. But nevertheless I wanted to mention it and it particularly illustrates the point that it was not like the Muslims were free and clear at this point. It's not like the Muslims were uh, completely accepted but there were still a lot of animosity and a lot a lot of anger and a lot of opposition towards the Muslim community even at this point. What this does is this brings us to the eighth year of Hijrah. Now in the beginning of the eighth year of Hijrah, there, are, there is a very remarkable story um, and that is in the very beginning of the eighth year of Hijrah, there's a very remarkable story. And that remarkable story is the acceptance of Islam by three of the most influential people in the city of Mecca, three of the most influential leaders of Quraysh, who had also, all three of them had previously been extremely active, staunch opponents of the Prophet ﷺ and of Islam and the Muslims. And all three of them accepted Islam in the beginning of the eighth year of their own accord. It was not like they were cornered or they were defeated in a battle or taken prisoner or anything of that sort. They themselves came to Medina to accept Islam and to basically join with the Prophet ﷺ and with the Muslim community. And those three individuals are Amr bin al As who was a leader and was primarily, his primary responsibility, he was the main emissary, the main ambassador of the Quraysh to many, uh, in, the Mac- in the Meccans, to many foreign governments and kings and rulers of different regions. He was by and far the most well-traveled of the Meccans of the Quraysh, and he had personal relationships. He was personally recognized by his name, in many of the courts of kings and rulers in different parts of the world. The second individual is none other than Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the third one is Uthman bin Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, the stories here of all three of them accepting Islam, they would actually all arrive in Medina together, and they would all accept Islam together in the city of Medina. However, they meet on the way to Medina. And the story, before they meet one another, the stories are divided into two stories. On one side you have Khalid and Uthman. Khalid bin Walid and Uthman bin Talha. They had decided that they were accepting Islam. And they had set out on their way to Medina. Amr bin al-As has his own unique story. He had decided that he was accepting Islam. And was traveling towards the city of Medina. And on the way, they meet one another. And then they proceed on together, all three of them, until they arrive in Medina. They meet the Prophet ﷺ and all three of them accept Islam. And give the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ and become a part of the Muslim community. So these two stories, before they, in, before they cross paths, before they join up together, what I'll be doing inshallah is today, I'd like to share the story of Amr bin al-As. And then inshallah in the following session, we'll talk about the story of Khalid bin Walid and Uthman bin Talha, how they got to the point of wanting to accept Islam, how they reached that point of embracing Islam. So we'll start with the story of Amr bin al-As. His story is mentioned in a lot of detail in the books of Bayhaqi, Waqidi, and many other books of Sirah. And also his story is summarily mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala as well. 
Amr bin al-As, he tells his story himself in the first person. He says, Kuntu Islami, Kuntu lil Islami mujaniban mu'anidan. He says, I was extremely opposed and very, um, I was very opposed to Islam and I was also very uh, bothered by Islam. I didn't like it. I was, I was bothered by it. I didn't like it. I wanted no part of it. I had, you know, refrained and abstained from it. And I also was extremely opposed to it. He says that حضرتو بدرن مع المشركين فنجوتو ثم حضرتو أحدا فنجوتو ثم حضرتو الخندق فنجوتو. He said, I went to the battle of Badr with the enemy, with the Meccans, and I survived. Even though seventy of the Quraysh were killed, many of the leaders of the Quraysh were killed. I survived. He said, I went to Uhud and I survived. I participated in the battle of the trench خندق and I survived. فقلت في نفسي كم أودعو. He said that I said to myself, and this was an expression in Arabic, he said, how many times are you going to risk death? How many times are you going to dance with the devil, as they say? Right? How many times are you going to play with fire? And so he says, wallahi, and he says, at that time I had a realization. Wallahi la yadharanna Muhammadun ala Quraysh. He says, I was convinced Muhammad was going to win this fight with the Quraysh. He said, at that time I fully came to the realization, Muhammad will come out on top in his conflict with the Quraysh. So he says that, I decided I was not going to stick around for that. I wasn't going to be here when that moment occurred. So he says, فَلَحِقْتُ بِمَالِي بالوحد. He says that I owned a piece of land outside the city of Ta'if. At Ta'if. So he says, I left Mecca and went to Ta'if and just... It was like a vacation home. Many of the chiefs of Quraysh, they would have vacation homes and gardens near At-Ta'if because it was nicer weather and things like that. So in the summer, they would retreat there. So he says, I just went there and I just started living there. I said, I'm not going to stick around to watch this happen. He says that basically I stopped interacting with people. Which basically means I retreated away from the public eye, from public office, from public service. I wanted nothing to do with this stuff anymore. And I was just living in my quiet little corner there in my garden outside of Ta'if. So he says, when Hudaybiyah happened and the Prophet ﷺ came and the treaty occurred and he went back. And Quraysh went back to Mecca. At that time, I said to myself once again, Muhammad is going to come back the next year to Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's going to come back to Mecca next year with his companions to perform Umrah as the treaty had dictated. And he says, Ma Makatu bi manzilin wala ta'if. Wala shay akhayru min al-khuruj. He says, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes back to Mecca the next year to perform Umrah, what's there to prevent him from taking over Mecca? And he wasn't too off target because even though the Prophet ﷺ, of course he respected the terms of the treaty, they didn't take over Mecca when they came for Umrah, but it would be a year later that they would be taking over Mecca due to the indiscretion of the Quraysh as we're going to talk about. But he said, look, Mecca is not safe. But he says, if they take over Mecca, Ta'if is not too far away. Ta'if will be the next to fall. So Mecca is not safe. Ta'if isn't safe. So he says, I have to just basically... Get out of town. I have to get out of Dodge. I have to be as far away from here as I possibly can. And he says that I, again, kind of did some soul searching and I felt at that moment that even if Quraysh, all of Quraysh was to accept Islam, I would not accept Islam. I wasn't feeling it at that time. So he says that I went back to Mecca. I gathered together some of the men of my tribe, my family, some of my confidants, my friends, I gathered them together and I said that, and they, they all used to respect my opinion. Many of these were the people who I had mentored, they used to treat me as, you know, uh, a counselor, and advisor. So I gathered them all together and I basically said to them that, كَيْفَ أَنَا فِيكُمْ What is my position amongst you? So they said, ذُو رَأْيِنَا وَمِدْهَرُنَا he says that you are by and far the most intelligent of um, amongst us. And secondly, you are our leader. We will all respect you deeply, profoundly. And he says that you are, you've always made the correct decisions, etc., etc., etc. So he says that you know that I, what I feel about what will occur in this situation involving Muhammad wasallam. I am of the opinion that he, much to my dismay, he says, Uluwan munkaran. He says, much to my dismay, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will come out on top. 
He will come out on top. That's how I feel. I have an idea. So they said, Mahua, what is that? He says, Nalhaku bin Najashi, Fanakunu Ma'ahu. Why don't we go to East Africa? Why don't we go to Abyssinia? Because if you remember, when the Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca in the early days, they went to Abyssinia, East Africa, and sought refuge, asylum with Najashi. And he granted it. And Amr bin al As knew because he was the one who the Meccans had sent to go and try to bring him back. And Najashi had refused and reprimanded Amr bin al As. And he says, I will not turn away people who seek and ask for my protection. I will not do that. So he says, look, Najashi is, has always been very open to granting people refuge and safety and asylum. So I say we go there. And, we, and by this time, the Muslims had left East Africa. Remember Ja'far bin Abi Talib and everyone, they had returned back at the time of Khaybar. So he says, we'll go and tell Najashi to take us in. So, and if Muhammad ends up dominating Makkah, as I predict, we'll be safe and sound with Najashi over there. And living under the rule of Najashi, to me, is better living under the rule of Muhammad ﷺ. Not because Najashi is any better, but because of the personal grudge and the history and the bias that the Makkans had at that time. And he says, and if Quraysh ends up eventually, as I don't think is going to happen, but if Quraysh ends up defeating Muhammad ﷺ, then, you know, we can always come back. We can always come back home. So they said, that sounds like a great idea. So he says, okay, if y'all are on board with me, I had a small contingent, a small group. I said, if, ever, if y'all are on board with me, then go and gather and collect whatever y'all can in terms of wealth and things like that, supplies, some funds to start a life there. And also particularly go and gather some goods that we can present as gifts to the king, an Najashi, to kind of win his favor over. And plus that's the ritual of the court. And he actually comments, he says, وَكَانَ أَحَبَّ مَا يُهْدَى إِلَيْهِ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا الْأَدَمْ He says, I had been I had visited the court of a Najashi plenty times, plenty of times before. And the thing that Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, that he was extremely fond of that we had in our land was a lot of the, the skins and the leather that we would have, like the hide of like camels and things like that. He was very fond of that. You know, sometimes even now in, you know, the, they'll have it in Arab culture where it'll be like a thobe or an abaya, like kind of like an overcoat that's made out of the camel skin, the camel fur. Right? So he said he's extremely fond of that. So go and try to get some really nice material like that, and we can package it and take it as gifts. So he says, Fajamana Adam and Kathir, and we got a bunch of those together. And we set out to go and meet with Najashi. He says, But there was an interesting plot twist. When we got to an Najashi, I saw there was a Muslim there. It was Amr bin Umayya al-Damri. Amr ibn Umayya al-Damri. Amr ibn Umayya al-Damri was a Sahabi who was unfortunately involved in a little bit of a difficult situation. The difficult situation that he was involved in was that he was captured by the Meccans and he was eventually able to kind of get free from them and he was trying to, this is earlier, we talked about this in one of the sessions, and he was trying to make his way back to Medina after escaping his captors. And as he was on his way back to Medina, he ended up crossing paths with a couple of Meccans who were not his captors. And he was so kind of like shaken because he had been cap- taken ca- captive and was held prisoner by them and they were going to take him to Mecca and that was inevitably to execute him. And so he was so rattled and shaken by this that they were just, these were just a couple of normal Meccans, not the ones who had taken him captive. And he just kind of, you know, freaked out in the nighttime and he kept waiting to see. They, you know, he was traveling, they were traveling and, you know, the, the, he had a fire running. So he said, hey, can we come and, you know, put up camp with you here and benefit from your fire? And he said, sure. And he said, I kind of like laid down, pretended to sleep and I was freaked out that as soon as I fall asleep, they're going to catch me and they're going to take me back to Mecca. And so he says that as soon as they fell asleep, I got up and unfortunately, tragically, he says, I, I killed them. And then I went back to Medina and the Prophet ﷺ found out. And the Prophet ﷺ had actually offered, you know, he paid blood money on behalf, the, the penalty that was to be paid in that instance to the families of the two that were killed. Nevertheless, because of that incident, Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri, he 
had a reputation back in Mecca where he was kind of like on the most wanted list of Mecca, of the Quraysh. So he says that we're walking in and we see Amr bin Umayyah al damri and I'm like, oh my God, look, it's him. And the reason why he was there was that the Prophet ﷺ had sent him because Ummu Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, who was one of the refugees, Muslim refugees who lived in East Africa, the uh, Najashi had proposed to the Prophet ﷺ that you should marry her. And the Prophet ﷺ had accepted it. And so the Prophet ﷺ had sent Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri to basically, she, the uh, Najashi prepared an entire convoy with her in it and some guards and things like that to go to Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ sent Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri to basically escort the convoy and bring them back to the city of Medina with the mother of the believers, Umu Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. So that's why Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri was there. But Amr bin al-As says, I see him and I'm like, oh my God, it's that guy. So he says, at that time I made up my mind, I'm going to go talk to Najashi, I'm going to give him these gifts, I'm going to get on his good side, and then I'm going to ask him if he will arrest Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri and hand him over to me so that I can basically execute him as a gesture to my people in Quraysh, in Mecca. So he says, I made up this whole plan in my head, and he says, I went in to meet Najashi, and he said when he saw me, he recognized me. Again, Amr bin al-As was kind of like that delegate, he was that ambassador. So he says, marhaban bi sadiqi. He says, welcome, welcome friend, it's been a while since I've seen you. And he says, ahdayta li min biladika shay'an, did you bring any gifts from me? And he says, naam ayyuhal malik, of course I did, O king. Ahdaytu laka adaman kathira, I brought many of these camel hides and skins for you. So he says, I presented it to him. فَعَجَبَهُ He was very happy. وَفَرَّقَ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا بَيْنَ بَطَارِقَتِهِ And he says, I had taken like a large stack of them, a lot of them, because I knew that when he received them, he would also want to give some of them to his ministers. As like, again, a gracious gesture of a king, of a ruler. So he distributed some of them. And, and then the rest of them that were left, he actually called his servant and he said, I want you to take these into my private quarters and place them there. Like he really just in, loved them and enjoyed them and valued them. It was his thing. So I saw the excitement that he basically had. I saw that he was in such a good mood. He was so happy and excited that I brought these gifts from him. So I said, Ayyuhal Malik, I saw this man coming out from here, Amr bin Umayyad Damri, and he is... The messenger of our enemy. Rasulu Adu Lana. He's the messenger, the you know, kind of message man, the errand man of our enemy. He runs errands for our enemy. And he Qatala Ashrafana wa khiyarana. He is actually wanted for having been involved in the wrongful death, the killing of some of our people. So I ask you to please surrender him to me so that I can execute him. So I can kill him. فَخَدِبَ مِنْ ذَلِكِ He said, and Najashi became extremely angry. وَرَفَعَ يَدَهُ فَضَرَبَ بِهَا أَنْفِي ضَرْبَةً ضَرَنْتُ أَنَّهُ كَسَرَهُ He lifted up his hand and he punched me in the face. Smacked me in the face so hard that I thought he broke my nose. And he says, my nose started to bleed. Like... In, almost immediately my shirt became covered in blood and I just took up my shirt and I started to try to stop the bleeding. And he says that, فَأَصَابَنِي مِنَ الذُّلِّ مَا لَوْ إِنْ شَقَّتْ بِيَ الْأَرْضُ دَخَلَتْ فِيهَا دَخَلْتُ فِيهَا He says, I felt so humiliated at that time that if the earth would have opened up, I would have just wanted to get sucked into the earth just to escape the hum- humiliation that I suffered at that particular time. So he says that, I was, and I was extremely afraid of what he was going to do to me at this particular time. So he said, at that time I said, Ayyuhal Malik, I apologize. I said, O oh, king, please. Um, if I knew that this would offend you, I never would have said it to you. And he says the king also kind of felt bad because the Najashi was an extremely devout, pious, righteous man. And we all know that he was also secretly Muslim at this time as well. So... He felt bad because he realized like he should not have struck me, especially in the face like that. So he felt bad and he basically said, Ya Amar. 
he, he kind of like spoke to me on the side, kind of privately one-on-one. He felt bad and he said, Oh, Amr, you want me to hand over to you the messenger, the courier of the man whom the great angel visits, the great angel that used to visit Musa alayhi salam. That angel visits this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And this man, Amr bin Umayya, whatever your qualms with him, your grievances with him may be, he is the courier, the representative of that great man, whom the angel Gabriel, Jibreel alayhi salam visits. You want me to hand him over to you? And he says that, not only that, he is the same, he is that man, he is visited by the same angel that visited Musa, and the same angel that used to visit Isa alayhi salam. Meaning he is a messenger, he's a prophet. And Amr says, when he said that to me, because he kind of said that to me on the side, and I didn't know because Najashi had been keeping his Islam private, secret. She said, when he said that to me, it hit me. Oh my God. Najashi believes in him too. So he says, at that time, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Ghayra. Ghayra Allahu qalbi amma kuntu alayhi. It's like Allah turned my heart in that moment. And wa qultu fi nafsi. And I said to myself, I thought to myself, عَرَفَ هَذَا الْحَقَّ الْعَرَبُ وَالْعَجَمُ وَتُخَالِفُ أَنْتَ I said to myself, I said, Amr, this is such an obvious truth, the truth of the message of Muhammad wasallam. This is such an obvious truth that both the Arab and now even the Ajam, the non-Arabs believe in it. And you, O Amr, for all your intelligence and genius and experience for all of what you claim to be, you still oppose it and everybody besides you sees it? What's wrong with you? Because he said at that moment I had that breakthrough that I had no reason not to believe in it. I cannot argue a single point of it. I'm almost just stubbornly just stuck on this issue. So he says at that time I realized this and I said, Atashadu ayyu al Malik bihada. And I said, I needed confirmation. I said, Oh King, do you believe in this message as well? He said, Naam, I do. If it's between you and me, I do. So he said that, uh, he said, Ashadu bihi inda Allahi Amar. I, in fact, will stand in front of God, O Amar, on the day of resurrection and testify to my faith in the, 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 the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My belief. So he says, he said to me at that time, فَأَطِعَنِي Follow me. Like follow my lead. I already believe. Believe. That's all you got to do. Follow my lead. وَاتَّبِعُهُ And follow the path of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَعَلَى الْحَقِّ Because I swear to God, he's on the truth. وَلَا يَظْهَرَنَّ عَلَى مَنْ خَالَفَهُ And not only that, but he will overcome his enemies. And his opposition. كَمَا ظَهَرَ مُوسَى عَلَى فِرْعَوْنَ وَجُنُودِهِ Just like Musa, Moses overcame Pharaoh and his army. So I then said to him, أَتُبَايِعْنِي عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ أَتُبَايِعْنِي لَهُ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ Will you in place of the Messenger Muhammad وسلم, until I cannot reach him as his representative, will you give me the oath of allegiance? Will you help me embrace and accept the faith? And he said, absolutely. So he said that he put out his hand, and I put my hand in his hand, and I accepted Islam at that moment. Then he called for kind of like a bowl, a dish of water. And he called for this water, and then with his own hands, he wiped all the blood, cleaned all the blood, he washed my face, cleaned the blood from my face. And then he called for clothes, his own clothes, the king's clothes, king's robes, royal robes. And then he told me, change into these. And I changed into those clothes. And I had made up my mind about what I had to do now. So he says, I came out from there and my party that was waiting for me had gone in to talk to the king. They were all waiting out there. What happened? And these were like really staunch enemies of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca. So they came out and they said, what's going on? What happened? And when they saw that I was wearing the robes of the king... They got happy. They said, looks like you've won the favor of the king. You're on the king's good side. So he says that, I, I told them, I said that 
you know, of course, me and King, we and the king, we go way back, and I took him these gifts, and he was very happy. So what he did was he gave me some robes of his as a sign of appreciation. But I was a little shy to make my request of him. Hand me over this guy so I can kill him. I was a little shy to do that. You know what? Let me, let me go try to talk to him again. Let me go try to talk to him again. So he says, they said, okay, absolutely, we trust you, Amr. We came all this way with you. We trust you. So he says that I left from there, and I said, oh, let me just, you know, use the restroom before I go back in and talk to the king. I need to kind of step out, use the outhouse. I need to go use the restroom. They said, yeah, sure, sure. You go do your thing. We're, we're waiting here. So he says, I went out to use the restroom, and I just took off. <laughs> I just disappeared. I was out, right? So I immediately took off from there. I had some money on me. I found a ride. I told them, take me straight to the port. They took me to the port. And over there, I looked for a boat, a ship that I could board. And I had some money. I said, I'll pay for a ride. I got onto the ship. I got onto the boat. And they took me all the way to the port of Hejaz. That was close to, closest port to um, the, the area where we were from, Hejaz, Mecca, Medina. And he says, I arrived there, and I still had some money left on me. So what I did was I bought a camel, and I got on my camel, and I immediately started traveling towards the city of Medina. I got to make it straight to the Prophet ﷺ. He says that while I was on my way, I stopped at this one particular campsite. This was kind of like a place where many travelers on this route, on this path would camp out. And when I got there, I saw that there were, there were two rides, two animals who were tied up. And so I said, oh, okay, looks like some travelers are already here. And there was like a little, they had already pitched a little tent. And there was one person who was outside the tent, one person who was inside the tent. And I just got a little bit closer. I was kind of a little cautious, curious, wonder who it is. And I got a little bit closer. And when I looked at the guy who was outside the tent, kind of like putting supplies up and together and stuff, it was Khalid bin Walid. And I was like, oh my God. I walked up to him and, you know, we're all colleagues, we're all friends, we're all peers. And I said, Ain I said, where are you going? He said, Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I'm going to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَلَمْ يَبْقَ أَحَدٌ بِهِ طَعْمٌ He says, everyone's accepted Islam. And there's not a single intelligent person left who hasn't accepted Islam yet. Everyone's accepted Islam. There's nobody in his right mind. There's nobody who's a good person who's left who hasn't accepted Islam yet. So he says that, I am therefore going to Muhammad Wasallam to accept Islam. So I said, I said to him, I said, me too. Wa'ana wallah. Me too. I'm going there to accept Islam. So he said, while we were talking, Uthman bin Talha was the guy inside the tent. He comes out, farahababi. He welcomed me. He said, hey, what's going on? And he said, I had the same conversation with him. And then all of us, we gathered together and we took the, undertook the rest of the journey together. He says, when we were right outside of Medina, something happened that just kind of... Because the Arabs were very, you know, they were very passionate people. They were people of emotion uh, and very observant people. They used to observe around them a lot. And one of the particular habits that they had was, they had the practice of tafa'ul, which literally translates to kind of like looking for good omens, like looking for good signs. And the Prophet ﷺ actually said, there's nothing wrong with looking for just encouraging good signs around you when you're doing something good. It's okay to kind of see that Allah is kind of like pushing you on your way and encouraging you on this path. So he says when we were right outside of uh, Medina at this one well, we heard a man, he was kind of like, we just walked up and first thing we hear, there's a man looking for his friend, looking for his buddy, and he's shouting, Ya Rabah, Ya Rabah, Ya Rabah. And Rabah basically means like good fortune, prophet, good. So he said, he's just shouting, Ya Rabah, Ya Rabah, Ya Rabah. And he said, we kind of took it as a good message, a good sign that we have come to a fortuitous, you know, kind of end and conclusion. Our very long, drawn out, 20 year journey in this conflict with Muhammad has reached a good, blessed, fortuitous end. And he said that we came to um, the, you know, and he says when we came upon that well, that man who was shouting, Ya Rabah, 
He was a Muslim. And when he saw us, and he particularly recognized myself, Amr is saying, Amr and Khalid, two very prominent leaders, he recognized us. He said he immediately shouted, he's like, oh my God, they're here. Like in a good way, because he could tell that you know, we weren't there to fight or anything. And he got so excited, he ran ahead of us, took off. Took off, like a bullet out of gun, an arrow out of its bow. And he just took off, running in the direction of the masjid, to go and tell the Prophet ﷺ that we were coming. And when we arrived there, the Prophet ﷺ, so he says, before we arrived there, we actually stopped a little ways outside of the masjid, because we had been traveling, and we changed into nice, clean clothes. We washed and cleaned ourselves up to be presentable. And by the time we got there, the adhan for asr was going on. Nudiya bil asr. The adhan for asr. So try to imagine that. They clean up, they wash up, they approach the masjid, the adhan is being called. And as they say we were walking in, to the masjid, hatta ittala'na alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We walked in and we saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting, looking right at the door, waiting for us. وَإِنَّ لِوَجْهِهِ تَهَلُّلًا And he was smiling and his face was radiating. It's like he was lighting up the entire room. وَالْمُسْلِمُونَ حَوْلَهُ قَدْ سُرُّوا بِإِسْلَامِنَا And all the Muslims were gathered up around him, smiling, so excited. The, the, the energy in the room was palpable. They were so excited at our arrival and accepting Islam. Khalid bin Walid proceeded forward, and then Uthman bin Talha went second, and then I went third, and we all sat down in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and we put our hands in the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, and we accepted Islam and gave him our oath of allegiance, and told him that we believe in him and we follow him. And, and while in the next session, inshallah, I'm going to talk about Khalid's journey, how he gets to this particular point. So we'll revisit this moment. But specific to Amr, he says something very interesting. He says that, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا هُوَ إِلَّا أَنْ جَلَسْتُ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ He says, I swear to God, when I sat down in front of the Prophet ﷺ, مَسْتَطَعْتُ أَنْ أَرْفَعَ تَرَفِي إِلَيْهِ حَيَاءً مِّنْهُ He says, I could not look the Prophet ﷺ in the eye, I could not look him in the face, I could not look him in the eyes. Just, I was so embarrassed. Out of embarrassment, I could not look up at him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he, the, Amr says that he gave me the oath of allegiance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven me of all my sins. I had no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed. Yes, I had fought and I had opposed. And I had made his life difficult. But he was saying, Allah has forgiven you. And he said to me at that time, Inna al-Islam yajubbu ma kana qablahu. Islam uproots, eradicates, weeds out everything that was there before it. Wal hijratu tajubbu ma kana qablaha. And not only that, but you made hijrah, you left Mecca and came here to Medina. Hijrah further wipes out everything that happened before it. And he says that, this is so fascinating. He says that, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا عَدَلَ بِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى 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 اللَّهِ صَلَ
And that also, we'll talk about more so later, inshallah. But part of the reason for that, very briefly speaking, is of course, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was like a big brother and a mentor to Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Whereas Amr bin al-As was older in age, so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to treat him kind of like as a colleague and a peer. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu served as kind of like a mentor and a teacher. To Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he used to kind of, and not only that, but Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu, militarily speaking, was like the right hand of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was his chief general. And his, his kind of like, you know, head of the army. So he used to depend and rely upon him a lot and similarly had expectations of him. But he just kind of mentions that as a side note. But the really remarkable and the beautiful thing is Amr bin al asas the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr, Umar, none of the Sahaba ever held it against us what had happened between us before we accepted Islam. You know, that's easier said than done. I just said it, you just heard it, we just talked about it. Just very casually, sitting back here, we just casually say, not holding it against somebody. You know how difficult that actually is? But that was the character, the graciousness, the forgiveness, the mercy, the benevolence of the Prophet ﷺ and of that community of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. That's what we need in our communities today. That's what we have to get back to today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that we've said and heard. Inshallah, we and and of course, Amr bin al As he says that um, we this whole story was in the month of Safar, uh, the second month of the eighth year of Hijrah, where all of this happened and transpired. Inshallah, in the next session, next uh, session, Inshallah, we'll be talking about how Islam, uh, how Khalid bin Walid, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, got to the point what convinced him to accept Islam after having led the army of the Quraysh against the Muslims. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك